Hey, what's up, gang? Uh, it's Mishka. Holy shit. Um, I am in Athens, Ohio. Rad and I made it safely through tour without murdering each other. Um, I did yell at him virtually every single day. Virtually, also, just, okay, we'll just cut the virtually out of there. I yelled at him every single day. The I'm terrible. I'm a bad dad. But he did great. The It was... I'll just say it. It was really awesome and inspiring to see a younger artist um, at that level in their career um, learning things incredibly quickly on the fly. We had sort of our biggest, most important show at on, on the first one um, in Fort Collins, and uh, the and he muffed a couple of s- small things and then uh, like sort of quickly ironed it out, um, set after set. You know, I could just sort of uh, watch him growing. Uh, so fucking fun. And, um, and he left a bunch of stuff in the van. I'm going to, I will auction it off to the highest bidder. Um, the, but yeah, I am out in, um, in, uh, gorgeous Athens, Ohio, freezing my butt off here. The all kind of weird stuff happening here, all kinds of things up in the air. The, I opened up for John Langford of the Mekons last night, which was just devastating sort of, a a master class in how to do it and how to stay in love with writing music and performing and creating. Um, so, so cool. Um, I'll be back at that same venue, uh, in January, January 4th, uh, with Jake Flores. That will be our kickoff show in Columbus, Ohio. Um, if you want to come hit me up for the link, it's a very cool, uh, very on the, on the DL house show. Um, but, man just such a next level experience last night um one of the things that i did manage to do before i left uh phoenix was i recorded a podcast with my old friend ryan mckee and when i was exporting the files i exported them with a click track because i have no idea what i'm doing and the so uh at the last second i tapped my old friend uh jay white cotton to jump on the podcast and we banged one out real quick uh, real fast, real intense. The if you're a comic, you probably know who uh, Jay White Cotton is. Um, how do I introduce him? the The first way I'm going to introduce him is to uh, to tell him that he's wrong. <laughs> he insists again and again that he doesn't know anything. Uh, that he's a dipshit. That he's uh, he's not smart. Doesn't have anything to offer. It's bullshit. That uh, he's one of the brightest, most insightful, uh, most um, uh, formally experimental comics I know. Um, he's been on my hit list since I started this thing. And uh, I'm embarrassed that I only finally sat down with him now. But um, you can hear uh, from the recording, we just sort of just jumped into it at 100 miles an hour and kept it up for the whole uh, hour and 15 minutes, probably. Um, talking about what it means to be uh, creative in in this world, in our fallen world and, um, how to, uh, how to keep going, how to not give up. Um, so please, uh, please enjoy this podcast with my friend, Jay White Cotton. Mr. Shabali is catching up with friends who are arguably more talented than him. And, uh, Oh, got it. Okay, there we go. The um, um, you know that if you guys use the same pop filter, that's uh, you're just it's like a Q-tip. You're just inoculating each other with. with oh yeah, yeah. I mean, well, we have been using it as a homemade condom. The a homemade that. condom that's been passed down th- from your family uh, from generation to generation. Uh, Generations of sure SM58 believers. Dude, I have a sponsorship from Sennheiser right now, and it's the best thing going on in my life. I have the, I just have fucking great microphones, and it makes such a huge difference in my life. Yeah, your life is like, uh, you're the closest thing to a rock star without being a rock star. <laughs> it's, I have reverse karma in that um, all the bad things that I've done in my life, I've turned into a career. No, I think that's why I enjoy what you do because. <clears throat> Because you pursued it in the way that you're untouched by anything popular. 
Does that make sense? Like, like it might be the root of some of your misery, but it's also the reason why you're uh, uh, watchable and uh, watchable. In fact, uh, I'll do you one favor. I'm going to give you a compliment that was passed on to me uh, after one of your gigs, which is a fun way to <laughs> start a podcast uh, from a booker <laughs> who was oh, asking no. my impression of you too, because. Uh, uh, also, I, I don't exactly know who this is. I have a suspicion. And, uh, if it is the person that it is, I, I love this person dearly. Uh, Hey pal, I have Mishka Sh- Shabali. Sh- it's misspelled. Who knows? Uh, I have Mishka Shabali booked next month. Kind of just accepted based on, I recognized his name. That's good. <laughs> You're getting name wreck. Uh, uh, branding always uh, be branding what can i expect from his show <laughs> and uh uh uh, uh, <laughs> uh i go it's like jonathan rickman for soft sad drunks that's that's accurate i'm i'm an emotional tenderizer yeah yeah it's uh he, uh, he does a bashful gritty troubadour thing and tells stories Basically like Eric Bogosian character, but for single indie moms. <laughs> I the, feel like I'm, that's a, expect a weird audience of old men and young Stanhope fans. I'm going to start a Tinder profile just to put all this on it. Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure that I was advertising correctly because sometimes with my friends, when I'm selling them, uh, my joy and, and what I love about them might not translate to good press. The other thing too, is that if, um, if you say like, oh yeah, he's a nice quiet boy, like that, you're just describing a serial killer. The, um, the only sincere compliment has, it's like, you have to put salt in cookies. Sincere That's- compliments only come with a little, little gotcha. I, I, I mean, that depends on the insecurity. I find uh, with serial killers, uh, the thing I'm most impressed by is their ability to just talk to anybody. <laughs> They're like telemarketers. Like I, I, couldn't be a de- I couldn't be a detective. That's all I'd be hung up about. It was like, so listen, you were able to talk to a strange stranger just before you murdered them, but you were able to, how did you approach them without feeling self-conscious? Is it because you know you're going to murder them and that gives you like the power to be yourself in a conversation, which is the thing you need to earn the trust necessary to murder them later in an abandoned uh, Ser- serial know. killer as life coach? I guess. I, or don't I guess know. death it's, coach too. the life hey, and I'm death a, coach. I, I believe there's there's positive lessons in everything. And I'm a fan of all perspectives because everyone comes from a, 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 an existence that I haven't experienced. So I don't dismiss it right away. The You're reminding me of a thing that I meant to bring up. I can't remember if I mentioned this to you before, but I, the, when people are like, Oh, why are there so many creeps in comedy? The, my bullshit armchair psychologist theory is that the way uh, psychopaths try to pass as human beings as they study other human beings and then, you know, for the sort of emotional cues and then try to replicate those to pass as human. And the, um, and I think that comics are sort of normal folks who do the same thing of studying, oh, how does a person sell a story with their eyebrows or what, um, what physical and emotional cues play out across their face to, to signify this emotion and it turns them into psychopaths. Right. And, and only psychopaths really obsess about those things uh, or <laughs> people who date psychopaths. Let's be fair to a lot of broken men. We know uh, myself included. Uh, let me, let me address that. Cause I thought that was very interesting. Number one, uh, no one really addresses why there's so many creeps in comedy, uh, except the creeps trying to hide the fact that they're the biggest creeps in comedy. So a lot of the most vocal in that community were the people that were uh, profiting off of it and did not care about it. So I'll, I'll name names if I have to, but they know who they are. Uh, the other side of it, and uh, this is what I find kind of fascinating, and it's hard to kind of contend with this uh, on an issue that I do care about, is that why do we? Why are there so many creeps in general that get away with their shit? 
And, you know, a lot of people can point to patriarchal, you know, uh, dialogues, feminist perspectives. There's, there's a lot to the question. But the fact is, the reason why so many of them succeed is because the, the general audience actually doesn't care about anything but their own personal life. And they let it happen. And it's only when we're uncomfortable, when it's right in front of our face, that we're like, ah, somebody has to do something about it. And then the people that are like the p first person to raise their hand in class because they need everyone's approval are like, well, I'll lead the charge. And it just creates a society of fucking hypocrites. But it's like gun control. You know, the uh, we're we're basically ready to watch an infinite number of children get murdered uh, just for the pew pew. You know the and uh, and when something ha bad happens, we uh, oh the um, thoughts and prayers. We'll we'll create a safe space. We're going to have a meaningful open dialogue about it, but n nobody really gives a you shit. You know, until let's, it let's, happens to them. Let's be actually let's uh, let's 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 get rid of that myth that they only care until it happens to them because Yavaldi voted for the GOP pro-gun Abbott candidate in Texas right after the shooting, right after the failure of the entire system. And they were like, fuck yeah, four more years, four more years uh, because uh, people are terrible and deserve everything they get. The only thing that can stop a rapist is more rapists. You know, uh, maybe, <laughs> we're, maybe those, we're just fucking maybe going those right into this, dude. <laughs> maybe those kids shouldn't be so easily shootable. <laughs> um, the fuck. Let's pause for a second. The no, no, you no, have, no, wait, that is a good point. Shoot no, 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 it's just pathetic. No, 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 it's just go for the go for the deal, go for the militia guys. No. They'll love it. They'll have the time of their life. I think we could solve this problem if we can get mass shooters to go after uh, like those back in the woods militia guys. Let them fucking get their fun out or go to Ukraine and take it out on our best friend Putin. The um, no, it's like the the Vietnam era joke of, uh, you know, how could you shoot a child? It's like, well, you just lead them a little less, you know, than you. You would an adult. You, oh, you don't raise them. <laughs> That's <laughs> you've never been around them. No, the um first off, thank you so much for doing this and for doing it on such short notice. The I've been meaning to have you since fucking day one. And it's the, it's sort of the, like the thing where when you were a kid and you would go CD shopping and you walk into the store and immediately forget everything that you wanted to buy when you were at the store. The but I had one in the can for this week with my friend Ryan McKee, who was a writer for uh James Corden. And I recorded the audio for that. <laughs> I'm sure he's having a great week. The, <laughs> what, do you want to get fired from the show that's canceling? No, no, no. He's, he was gone years ago. The, but Take um, my I, episode off. But it's over. It's done. You can't, I, you can't tip. I recorded... <laughs> I recorded uh, the podcast with him with a, to a click track and it's on my computer in Phoenix and I can't fucking redo it. What condition uh, does he have that requires a click track? Has he got a stutter or a, 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 a very a, syncopated stutter? The, the James Corden Heil, a special man. I just, I just fucked it up. The Jay, how the hell are you? What's going on? You know, uh, I, I, the, the answer is always never good. Um, <laughs> And I hate the question. I resent people for asking it because it's a very American thing to ask people a question they are not interested in the answer to. The one I I've talked about this with somebody else that one of my favorite things about people in the UK is that when somebody asks you how you're doing, you can a a good response is standard, which is that's such a fucking UK thing to do. Man, that's way better than mine. Mine was for a long time. My automatic response was making it tired, just that. And then I realized that that wasn't the answer. The answer was fine. How are you? A never lie. Yeah. Except the... I mean it. I'm actually interested. And then it gets harder to go. But anywho, I'm okay. I'm okay. I guess. I don't know. We'll find out. It's uh, north, north of suicide, south of okay. It's an emotional day. I was I was laughing when because uh, I got some news right before we did this that made me go ah fuck all right shit all right this is uh keep it together uh, oh my god oh tell cool me I'm, the... I'm talking to Mishka uh this is a perfect energy to have but it, unfortunately it's not an energy I can share 
Okay. Uh, 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 due to other people's lives being involved. It's all good. We all have uh, public secrets. The I was thinking, uh, you know, earlier today that uh, how to sort of tell you what the podcast is about or whatever. The and then I saw a post from Ben Roy where he was just talking about COVID and it being the you know the worst three years of his life. And I feel like that's become the frame for this of just how were the worst couple of years of your life, you know, the, but you've had this massive fucking transformation. You're one of those people who like took the ball and ran with it when, um, when COVID hit, when lockdown happened. I, I don't, I well, I don't know how to uh, tell you how wrong you are on that perspective, but the, it means you, that you can't take a compliment either. No, it's, it's, well, it's not a compliment rooted in truth. It's a compliment rooted, hold on. And truthfully, this is not a, a, a slam and this is not a negativity thing either. It's a compliment rooted on uh, our casual observing of observations about our friends' lives online when we don't have uh, the time that we used to to be able to keep in touch properly the way friendships need. So when I, whatever I'm going through, the fact that it's not obvious and didn't uh, burden people who themselves were going through the worst times in their lives was pretty much my only goal. And, and so that makes me feel very good that you're like, it seems like it transformed and taken off. And I'm like, no, no, I just dove deeper, baby. Well, I was just talking about your body. I'm just I'm Oh, saying, that, the superficial. <laughs> ah, hey. I'm just saying you're much hotter now. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I fucking hate it, man. I hate like uh, I can tell uh, how good it's getting uh, based on I, I got growled at by like like ex strippers you know they're too old for the strippers like the the forty five right there that that's that's where your, I am buddy your demographic my, my stripping career is over right I've, I've no they it. they fucking love me uh, and uh, it's I one growled at me they made eye contact at a Ross dress for less uh, mirror I was trying out a jacket. They should just started growling at me and it was real and it scared the shit out of me. And I was like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I might start eating again. What was she growling without moving her mouth? No, she went. <laughs> Did she follow it with snap into a slim gym? No, I left the store. I paid. I think that was left. her next step was she was about to snap into a slim gym. Hey man, quarantine was very lonely. People's lives have completely changed. I, I used it to uh, to lay low and experiment and start asking questions and kind of witness. And an, I've always been on the outside. You know, uh, it's not something uh, I, we've talked about this before, but it's not something I, I, I've always enjoyed uh, or uh, wanted. But it's something that I, I've always had to contend with while knowing that a lot of people present themselves as outsiders and, and they're really not. So it's just fucking more annoying to deal with that when you're like, you don't know what you're asking for and it's not what you think it is. There is a pervasive outsider fantasy in America. Yeah, yeah. it's a fantasy for sure. And it's unnecessary. I, I'm a fan of cooperation, collaboration, uh, communication. I'm a free speech guy, not because I need to say the N-word, but because I really think that the only value that we have as a species is our ability to navigate as individual creatures. And at the same time, depending on a situation, we instinctively, by our nature, become either herd or like a, a hive or a colony. You know, who we are, depending on who we're around, it's really dependent on the people we surround ourselves. Some people are leaders in one group and they're the fucking losers of another group or the funny guy in a group. But it's always these very limited, similar archetypes. And, and I found the whole thing just kind of curious. So I started asking myself two questions. Uh, what is a human being? And uh, why do I think the things that I think? Like, where do my thoughts come from? And there were such basic questions that every time I would talk about it to other people, they'd just be like headaches, like, Jay, what the fuck? What are you doing with your life? And I'm like, oh, nothing. I'm a fucking fuck up. I'm a loser. And I want to know why I think what I think. And I want to know what the fuck we are, because I don't think anything's ever going to be fixed or anything actually progressive until we identify these things about a human being that we need to learn, not how to shame each other to profit with but to learn how to manage and accept. So 
what did you come up with in response to these two questions of what is a human being and where do my thoughts come from? Where do these thoughts come from? The Well, it, it depends on the situation, you know, like each individual thought, you know, when we have a perspective, sometimes we forget that in our minds, I, I compare it to like a 13 year old or a 14 year old, and we think we outgrow it. But I think about it in terms of music. Do you remember when you were first getting into music? Oh, yeah. What was it? What was it that turned you on and made you feel like you were separate from everybody else and yet connected to something else? I mean, the it's hard to sort of pick the cutoff because when I was a kid, it was like, you know, Sharon Lois and Bram and like Raffi yeah. and shit like that, that, and just, you know, uh, jumping up and down until the, you know, the turntable skipped. Yeah. That's uh, a different but, thing. That's, that's a, that's a, a, that's a youthful enjoyment of just music for its sake. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I think, I think that was sort of like primate enjoyment of, of music as opposed to, um, identity through the music that we've chosen the music we've chosen to reject and the music we've chosen to amplify i feel like two uh two seminal uh texts in my music uh, library would be um uh, stay hungry by twisted sister yeah. and the la bamba soundtrack oh yeah that makes sense the right so um i mean no one can deny the the power of fucking eighties heavy metal, and then uh, La Bamba. It's all about uh, nostalgia, death, loss. Um, you know, Richie and his flying guitar. It's the beginning of rock and roll. It's the beginning of the story in that, like in that vicinity in that era. There's a lot of mythology to it. There's a lot of romanticism to it. Uh, a lot of the human story can be told through the. Uh, beginnings of rock and roll and how people attach themselves to it how industries uh came from it and how philosophies were developed from it that inserted itself into fashion and art and it, in many ways we can say it's not even rock and roll it's the ingredients of rock and roll because one of the forgotten ingredients to rock and roll and you've hinted at it is latin music yeah, like absolutely. a lot of that shit by the wrecking crew uh uh by uh carol k and all that uh their influence was latin jazz and they brought it to all a lot of uh, a wide spectrum of pop music that we don't really kind of recognize i think lieber and stoller uh tapped into a lot of that too i mean they're oh, yeah they were sort of pulling from everything you know for the shit they were writing for the, the coasters and you know stuff like that that's um, that's that's exactly the kind of things that I've been interested in. That's why I'm asking why do I think the way why I think because I compare it the same way that I I view why do I enjoy this in music? What was it in this music and what influenced that? And what influenced the thing before that? And it's a process of understanding how people have evolved that creative mindset. Like we're talking about songwriters from like a hundred years ago, <laughs> you know, basically. Well, I, I think specifically too. I mean, for me, just thinking about it now, the that so much of the La Bamba soundtrack, it was about a sense of loss, a sense of regret, a sense of uh, this thing was spoiled or lost before I ever encountered it. Right, which right. is that's something I've carried with me everywhere I've gone. That the, explains a lot. Right. The but yeah. but what were those? So what were what were those albums for you? You know where you sort of you were like this is who i am and 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 i'm not part of the other thing man uh, it was so many because i think i suffered from the same thing a lot of hyper creatives suffer from it's um it's that's uh i i luckily was able to catch this and avoid this because i never wanted any of my taste to become my personality you know, I, I was surrounded by that and it just felt artificial to me. And as an outsider who's trying to be in, I never understood conformity at the same time. Like I, I, it, it seems so alien. It's like, that's not who you are, though. That's just that's an expression of a taste. That's a part of you. That's fine. That's acceptable. But that's not the totality of your existence. Like goths, you know, you're not always fucking goth when you're at the store buying cereal. You can't be fucking sad getting your marshmallow mateys. <laughs> uh, the, for me, uh, it, it was also the things that connected were also the things that highlighted the fact that I couldn't connect. So I was really into uh, pre-war and post-war blues. Uh, uh, and 
I feel insecure saying that because there's a certain aspect of our culture today that has gone against the idea of a young 10, 11 year old white boy uh, surrounded in misery finding joy and a music that comes from a culture and a background that he's not experiencing, but he's sharing from, you know, I understand physical violence and alcohol fueled rage and uh, all this, all the themes that I was surrounded by were showing up in that music. And I'm like, it's so downtrodden. (laughs) Beautiful. It's an expression of beauty and pain. Well, I think too, that, you know, we, um, when we when we approach somebody being a fan of that music, we imagine them to be a 19 year old with a fledgling drinking problem and like a, a fedora, you know, that, okay. that it's an affectation or something. I, um, But for you to be that into that music that early, that is remarkable. Well, it, it ruined my life. Uh, <laughs> I'm learning by like dating single moms now that um, the one of the vital element that children need is the community of other children to be able to talk to the adults of their future. And okay. if you don't have the same, like, I think it's the way homeschooled kids have it rough, you know, or, or certain. There's always something weird about them. Yeah. There's, well, there's something, we, it's understandably weird because we can chalk them up to, they're possibly Mormon or they're just weird from a religious angle. We can understand that, comprehend it. But if you come from that same place, but you don't have that um, archetypes to fall back on for people to be able to put you in a fixed place of understanding, then it's crazy alone or it's weird. It's weird. It's something for, like we have an, an innate inability to, uh, I think, because of cultural caste systems and divides be able to properly uh, communicate if we're not raised with the same people we're going to be adults with later. Yeah. The, I mean, I I think I'm I'm trying to define in my head, like what always, you know, set like homeschool kids off um, from, uh, for me and my friends and, and perhaps they're it's polite. The, That's they, why. Well, and, and they seem to be like wholly integrated human beings. They don't, they haven't gone through that. Like the, um, the 300 thing where you throw like all your children in the ravine and then what, whichever ones, you know, come out, those are the ones you keep, you know, the, right. they haven't gone through that, like, you know, bath of years of cruelty and get getting stomped and getting your fucking shoes taken. And, um, people finding out uh finding things to rhyme with your last name and then taunting yeah, them yeah. about that for 10 fucking years you know that yeah, just yeah. that level of demoralization the it's like homeschool kids emerge as uh, whole people not just uh fragments like or ghosts like yeah. the rest of us useless to today's society yeah yeah exactly the you know it's like an egg it's not good unless it's broken <laughs> see this is the shit i enjoy i, I love i like scramble but I don't want to take away anyone's ability to enjoy sunny side up. I think both can exist, but I feel like the way the human being, whatever a human being is, uh, I guess I'll get to that one. Cause that, that was the one that I think really kind of got me. Uh, oh, I, I was absolutely a uh, headache guy with that question. Uh, uh, the Jay, can't you just tell jokes and write songs? The I, why not you got answer this, why you got a philosophy on me, but the, I but don't yeah, think it's philosophy. Me. I think it's business. Okay. I see it. Okay. I, I see this as business. Um, if, uh, if you understand what a human being is and you understand what an audience is and you understand the difference between the individual and the group, it gives you a better understanding that maybe a lot of mental illness might be the inability naturally for someone for whatever electronic reason in the brain or neuro- whatever is the, in- the, sometimes I think we get stuck between an individual state of state of mind and the group state of mind. And we get caught somewhere in the spectrum between and uh, quite often that can create others. Uh, other people will create psychosis from that. Some people will get stuck on mythological archetypes for definitions to, to explain their thoughts. So it becomes like this weird form of pop culture hieroglyphics. And if you understand the references, you can understand better what they're suffering from. Well, other people just view that conversation as the most annoying, gayest conversation any human being can have and reject it outright from a completely different sex of uh, uh, insecurities, you know, all of which is to me equal and important to understand when, when you realize that audiences may no longer be viewing 
art the same way that they did when I was influenced to want to try and be an artist. Meaning, I think audiences today are thinking in a 21st century mindset, which uh, might be considered more shallow, but definitely more about their, their experience individually and what they want from performers is people that are archetypes of themselves on stage, avatars, something that they can see themselves in more than someone weird and that they've never seen before, giving them a perspective that they're not used to. The, the lonesome troubadour. Every worse, worse. Nobody really wants the lonesome troubadour. They want to see themselves, hey. an audience of lonesome troubadours. Okay. The, I was like, I get gigs sometimes. The um, No, it's getting harder for you to get gigs because your audience is trying to pretend to be you. Like there's this weird aspect of culture that's embraced certain archetypes. Like, like I noticed this when I was around uh, doing comedy and everyone's doing, hey, we drinking tonight, doing that one. And the crowd's like, yeah, because it was the easiest thing to cover up the fact that you have no fucking point of view. You're just, yeah, I like fucking boozing, you know? And then people took that, ran too far, and then suddenly they used it for sobriety. And, th- and this is the part where I have to be careful because I know you have to deal, it's probably not the hardest part that you have to deal with sobriety as part of your journey and, and pitch uh, presenting yourself online. It's the all the frauds that you know who attach themselves to it because they knew it was an angle they could succeed on Thus polluting yours. So now people have to question even your sincerest fucking values. I, the, yeah, there are a lot of people off- offering sort of uh, sober life coaching apps for $40 a month, which I, I think is, uh, they're fucking charlatans and it's bullshit. And it's, uh, you're, you're making a, you're commodifying victims. Um, but the, but also, you know, and I've spoken honestly about this that I, I, reluctantly commodified my own sobriety um yeah. it's, well it's it's not necessarily the, well, the feeling that you're feeling right now is what i'm most interested in because you feeling right now that you're about to you have to apologize for trying to succeed in this shitty stupid world where we defined who's essential and not essential yeah i mean they're um you well, shouldn't have thing? to you shouldn't feel this way well, you, you should know, be able they, to go, yeah, I commodified this thing sincerely and I did it openly and I told everybody that was listening, I'm doing this thing and here's the reasons why I'm doing it. And if you accept that, then you take it upon yourselves. If you connect to that, then we build our relationship as artist and audience based on that. That well, to but, me is perfectly acceptable. I, uh, yeah. I mean, it's acceptable. It's, it's not pure, you know, there's no, uh, there's what, no who, there's, okay. Wait, 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 let, me, let, let me let me let me get this out. There's no Please. ethical consumption under capitalism, but there's also no ethical production under capitalism that market forces are bearing on all of us all the time. So at the even when you try to make something that's absolutely pure, that there is that noise of the fucking dollar signs or whatever in your ears. You know? That's why I asked the question: Where do our thought? Why do I think the way I think? Because the question I have to ask that never gets asked because we instinctively feel like we we both know this answer. Uh, one, what do you mean pure? Two, who the fuck says what's pure? And three, wait a minute, none of this has ever been pure. We just talked about two writers that were stealing Latin jazz music to incorporate in pop, rock, and roll because they knew no one cared about Mexicans and they'd get away with it. And at the end of the day, if we blame the Jews, they'd hide behind the Holocaust and they would say, we can't be yelled at because we... Hitler did a bad thing and we're like, you're right, but you do control the media and you are doing a great job, but some of these royalties got to go to some of these black artists because they're starting to lose their fucking minds. The, uh, oh, there's a lot there. I know. Um, I I like throwing a lot, but just bringing it back to the root of it is, uh, fuck it. Who says this is pure? What is pure? I mean, an, an important word that you said there is, um, pop you know, pop music, pop culture, the, when it's popular, the, it is, you're trying to move units, you know, the, I mean, I, I think about, um, uh, Ikiyu, who was a Japanese monk in the 15th century. And, you know, they're sort of like living in isolation and hardship, uh, you know, a, a strong culture of asceticism and stuff like that. There was no, um, you know, there was no, 
getting likes or getting the you know getting the fat check or whatever but um but also like icky you was sick for pussy you know the like half the poems that he wrote were to to the whores in the brothel you know so everybody um no nothing is pure but the um, i don't know that sounds all pretty pure to me the guy liked pro- <laughs> he would loved his prostitutes what's let the man love his prostitutes the, Are the he, prostitutes there by choice? That's the only thing I'm concerned about in this situation. And what's if their cut? How, how much de- is the house taking? If, if, if it's their unhealthy decision and it's controlled and run by women, it makes more sense to me. That's all. I don't want to partake. I, I come a different way, but I don't want to judge something as not pure because of a 15th century. That's what are you talking about? <laughs> why, is he, why did you think of that guy? I I don't know. I'm just saying in the pure of pure art. What 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 pure art? I I do think in feudal Japan too, because I'm a white guy that from the 80s and 90s. So I think our minds do go there uh, naturally because of what influences us in media. But essentially, I think what you're talking like what's well, the, the, there were there was a strong tradition with the Celtic monks too. Where they were like they made these cairns that were called like uh, they looked like beehives, and they would just b- make them out of sort of like loose rocks, and then live right there on the beach, just in the freezing yeah, cold yeah. with like rags and. I shit. think but you're they, pure. You're the troubadour who goes around plying fucking some like here's some new shit I'm working on. Here's it's all sincere. I'm writing this from a sincere place to entertain you and to connect with you in a way that I can't connect regularly as a person to me is far more sincere and is the pure way. Even if you deal with some ideas occasionally that aren't from a pl- your own perspective, but you're writing from a perspective, something else or the story in the song isn't exactly the way it was, but you know, you're the story you're telling is better this way. Like those are all things you're allowed to do as a singer songwriter, troubadour, all that shit's pure, but the feeling of it not being pure is a feeling that has been provided to us that is being used to define our artistic directions. And I'm just asking which motherfucker said what is pure? Well, I mean, the uh, the stupid Ooh. thing about purity and concepts of purity is that it's an absolute that is, you know, it's like... Uh, I can you, tell you where it comes from. But I want to know get, if the people saying it knows where it comes well, from. Well, getting into heaven or not, you know? No, the, fuck that. I'm talking about, it's the fucking Beatles. Brian Epstein. <laughs> so, Brian, Beatles, would, the, the Beatles which precede heaven and Catholicism and Christianity. The second... The fucking Beatles realized, hey, you don't have to be too juice stealing Latin jazz music and <laughs> black music. We can be just two British fucking teenagers stealing Motown riffs and just talking with love in and be fuckable. And we could just make way more money. All right. Everyone should be writing their own songs. That is an artistic, pure value. And don't steal from us. While we're stealing from everyone else to figure us out and invent these rules that don't really exist. That's where the whole aspect of purity, it comes from this rock and roll notion that you're supposed to write every song yourself. And it's, uh, it comes from uh, in film, Orson Welles. You have to be the writer, the director, the producer. You have to be all things to be considered legit in today because we, mytholo- we, we mythologize uh, through Quentin Tarantino through Orson Welles, through the beat, like this idea that you have to be able to fucking do everything. The let's talk. You work about, with heels. You work with heels because it gave an aspect to your sound that made you excited, and yeah. it really brought out a lot of interesting shades to the the art that you're bringing on, and it created better art. I'm saying, why do we dismiss that so quickly? I think the, that's beautiful. Well, I mean, I I think you know to tie it back into the like the La Bamba soundtrack I mean I think the reason that we're obsessed with purity is because it's unattainable and the and it's compromised by anything you know and human beings have a hard time conceptualizing anything that's not a binary concept or you know things that aren't absolutes you know one work can be purer than another and I think that that's what you want to push for the but um I don't know does that make any sense to you no, I, it sounded like bullshit. <laughs> uh, only be, when you started bringing in the binary and non-binary as abstracts, and I'm like, no, those are pretty, <laughs> pretty basic. I think binary code is the most basic of all 
Zero, I mean, one, there's zero, a, there's an evolutionary advantage to binary thinking of the, is it food or is it poison? You know, the, yeah. um, is, if friend Language. or foe, you know, the Language skills, what does that word mean? You know, like all these things are things that we've gotten commodified and, um, perverted by pop culture and cool culture and rock and roll to sell shit. And to me, when you were talking about capitalism, it does go back to where's the money. How can we get that money? And when it, it fuels innovation, when like that's a that's a perspective of greed. Like it'd be very easy for us to get in a conversation about the evils of greed and what it does to the arts. But let's be more honest on a what is a human being thing. We're fucking greedy and we demand fairness. We're monkeys in that manner. So on that instinct, um, if you use that greed and suddenly everyone's like, you make more money writing and creating your own expression art. Suddenly you have this giant boom of creativity combined with technology uh, advancing so that uh, it can be replicated to the middle class and the poor. Uh, what it, To me, that's a better system versus a greed that would make you want to buy up all those people, film and record them, and then say you own everything they play and they can no longer play those songs again or make money off of it because you own it. That to me is greed that destroys innovation. So yeah, that we I, have to, I, yeah, I, we have to be I think there is now. like um there can be um, sort of selfish altruism, you know, the, and a good example of that is like masking up, you wear a mask to protect yourself, but in the process right, right, right. you protect everybody else. The, it's a mentality thing more than it was a, a medicinal thing that unfortunately got turned into a, what the fuck are we doing? Why are we destroying our lives over this thing? This is not the first problem we should be fighting about, but it's the one unessential people do in a society where your job means fucking nothing are forced to find value in their own fucking existence my friend as a business decision how do you entertain those fucks is that is that a, a rhetorical question or a no it's the question i've been dealing with for the two years uh, on how to uh, how to navigate this new function of industrialization in the arts meaning now, like, I don't mind people hustling for themselves. I, I have no problems with that. I don't even mind posers in the sense that we are all trying to uh, sell a product that is entertaining. And the audience should understand that what's behind that is a lot of hard work and human shit that is not put on stage because no one needs to see that shit. But apparently... I think there's an entire society of people that really needs to see the human shit because they've been sold these personalities for so long. They just feel like drained. I, I don't know what it is, but it's interesting. That, that makes sense to me that, that um, people have been sold uh, archetypes and sort of flat one dimensional characters for so long that they, they want to see people who is sort of more complex, complicated, flawed characters. The, I, mean, I guess they, I guess that would sort of explain in part the blow up of like indie rock and indie comedy. Um, I, I think that was mostly uh, the pop punk kids getting older and discovering Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska and then using that to shame other people. Oh, you don't listen to Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska. Oh, you listen to Born to Run. I mean, that's great. I love it, but it's not Nebraska. You know, it's all a cultural shaming device. Human beings are fucking trash. And even the best of us gets used as a shaming device against the rest. It's a, we're, we're really obsessed with uh, status. And unfortunately, it's a shallow thing in the arts, and it creates shallow art. And I'm having a hard time uh, when I realize that the path to succeed, the direction, is no longer a path to succeed, but a path of cyclical platforming content generation that only benefits the people who set up the platforms. Scroll, and that platform culture that platform can be online or it can be in the form of a quote unquote comedy club that makes its that pays its hosts to advertise to comics to fill up the room and people show up hey that's great the comics are drinking no matter what so you're not developing your talent you're just giving them an opportunity to have their karaoke song sung but it's their 3 minute act and yeah, yeah we all work for the liquor industry I'm fine with that. But at least before, <laughs> when the mafia ran it correctly, there was a path that the better liquor, the more liquor you sold, the more you could dictate in your career, a la like a Dave Attell. 
But now it's not about selling liquor. It's about selling views, likes, numbers, uh, algorithms that we know are in, are bullshit. We know fundamentally, emotionally, and this hurts. This really actually hurts. We know if we get a play that gets 1,000 views, we know 998 of those views were the first six seconds. And then someone said, what the fuck is this shit? And moved on. And uh, it's we've done that with our dating, with Tinder and swiping. And it's all kind of inhuman. The monkey's not handling this well. I feel this in my bones. My I have emotional intelligence. I don't really have actual intelligence. I'm telling everyone I feel like you're all doing this terribly wrong. And I'm saying this as an outsider desperately trying to be a part. So what's the way forward? Uh, everyone needs to, we need to figure out what a human being is. That's really the answer. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. But it, you can't solve a problem if you can't address what the problem is and why those problems routinely happen up. And why we love to ignore that it routinely happens and pretend like history isn't filled with anthropological evidence saying that we're at heart monkey and human being is something to uh, learn how to become, but it's not something you're born with. I think it's like all this, if we get back to Japan, when we talk about that discipline, I honestly think they were the closest, and that might be because they weren't affected by like flood mythology like the rest of the world due to their altitude and location. But I, I honestly believe that uh, discipline, every moment mattering, uh, even concepts like uh, finding uh, wabi-sabi, the perfection of imperfection and the beauty in that, uh, these are all disciplines that you, you used to think about and apply towards ex uh, situations in life. But unfortunately, I don't think that will happen because our greed has been used against us and we're now painted in a corner that we actually have to have an entire generation go, fuck, we got too much shit. We, we ran wild with this. We, got, we, got, we all need a diet and we all need to start working out and we need to start, we, we got to start. Okay, you want the answer? You're not going to like it. I have let's hear it. Let's hear it. it. He's trying so hard not to say it. No, no, but let's it, do it. All right. I, I figured out this is the answer on how you fix the pro every problem going okay. on right now, the root of it. Uh, criminalize lying. Okay, keep going. No, think about that. Criminalize the act of lying so that when people ask you questions, you have to be honest. And if you're not honest, Depending on the lie is depending on what punishment you get. So if you're a banker and you're running drugs that are enslaving, prostituting uh, tribal women or whatever that commonly still happens to this day, um, you go, you're dead. You get killed for lying about this and, 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 and funneling bank money. If you, if you lie to me about watching my special, that's, that you, you owe me a Coke. <laughs> You know what I mean? But you criminalize it. There's a fine system. There's degrees of lying, except in entertainment. If it's in entertainment, all of it can get, all of it passes. You can say whatever wild shit. It's all fantasy because the audience inherently comprehends realities where we don't lie, fantasies where we're allowed to do whatever the fuck we want, and that's where it stays. But it'll never happen because you can't profit off that kind of world the same way you can profit off a world of lies. I mean, I think this is fucking insane, but I um but also I'm a maniac about fiction versus nonfiction and what you can do in fiction. Oh, I don't what you can't do in it's insane if you believe that I'm genuinely gonna start a campaign. Hey guys, let's stop lying to each other. I would be lying to you right now if I did that. I would be lying to myself. But the act of learning how we lie to ourselves, I think, is very, very important. And having these conversations where we talk about this, because everything I'm saying right now, I'm, I'm, I'm having with artists, and I've been having for two years. And unfortunately, the people most affected by the things that I think are hurting us are the ones going, Jay, this sounds like crazy talk to me. This is insane. You're unhinged on various levels until e right now. I, this happened. This started happening about a year and a half ago, and I, I thought I was losing friendships over it. 
And in the past couple of days, the people that stopped talking to me a couple of years ago because of this exact same conversation, exactly, are now like, oh, dude, you're, you're, uh, you're ahead of your time again. I forgot you do that sometimes where you're, you were six months or two years ahead of your time and you saw some shit and you couldn't vocalize it the way I could understand it. And now they're starting to feel what I'm talking about and the machinations of the things that are influencing their decisions. I, I'll give you a great example. Okay, uh, I'm going to explore this in, in, in like an essay, I think. Dave Chappelle is a loaded word in and of itself. When I say the words Dave Chappelle, that conjures a lot of different perspectives. And uh, Dave Chappelle in the news brought Elon Musk on stage, who conjures up a whole bunch of other perspectives. And the conversation is now, fuck this guy, fuck that guy, that guy hates this. It, it, it just goes money, money, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Now, some people on my page who I, I love dearly are like, man, Dave Chappelle is a phony. He's a fake. He's a rich guy pretending to be street. You know, their perceptions are, some people are like, he's anti-trans. He's, he's like, no, he's just a fucking dipshit comic. Hold up a second. But underneath that, he's a human being. And he's a black dude that had to live in America. So we have to draw this back a little bit. I, I need your help with this because I think like me, you also can become knee-jerk reactionary when everyone's heated and we emotionally feel that. We're like, man, this guy's making all my fucking friends fucking angry. Fuck, I hate this guy. But we don't actually know why we hate him. We just hate the fact we got to know all our friends are agitated. There's, there's levels to this. But here, here's what I want to say. I remember in the early 2000s, at the very beginning where I wanted to start doing stand-up, I remember... When Dave Chappelle didn't want to do his show on Comedy Central anymore. And I remember hearing about how Dave, Dave, Dave Chappelle is an unhinged lunatic who's addicted to methamphetamines and crack. And he's running off to Africa. And they were just repeating the Richard Pryor fucking libel and shit that they were using against him that we know for a fact was propaganda. And the whole reason that, he, that they were screaming at him was conveniently at the time where in his contract, he was supposed to make a giant sum of money because they didn't think he could do it. And they didn't want to pay that giant sum of money. They thought it was unfair to pay him what he was contractually owed. So they said, how about 10%? And he said, fuck you. I'm a man first. I am not going to be greedy in this situation. And I'm going to go tell people how you're trying to fuck me. And the next day, all the media outlets were presenting him as an unhinged lunatic for not taking the money, clearly addicted to meth, who's going to run away back to Africa, a black man. And they've been doing that shit to, to low people, the same way we talked about the songwriters. All of entertainment's just rife with this evidence that we just continuously ignore as we enjoy our songs. I remember that Dave Chappelle. So all I'm saying, that guy had to disappear for fucking 10 years. 10 years of I'm Rick James, bitch, being thrown at him by this fucking douchey fucking element of his audience. He had to wait 10 years for him to be missed enough that people were willing to hear his voice. And uh, you don't think he feels a little guarded and a little more uh, nation of Islam about his shit? You don't think it's interesting that his best friends, you wouldn't be, if you went through all that shit where they personally attacked your mental health and called you a drug addict for not taking the money that one was ripping you off and not accepting that as a human being, a consciousable fucking man, you wouldn't want the world's quote unquote richest man to be on your side. Of course he loves Elon Musk. I would want every rich motherfucker on my side to protect me from the very people that try to assassinate me as a human being. But we don't think about it in those frames. We just see a man who's pissed off at a superficiality such as your gender, which is important to a lot of people. But when you get behind it, it's because they have nothing behind them other than that, or they're lost because they're in this world where they don't have a definition or a direction for what a human being is. You're allowed to be non-binary or non-binary. No one should be able to tell you otherwise. He should be able to say his jokes and you should be able to say, go fuck yourself, Dave Chappelle. But I also understand why you might be unhinged right now based on the past 20 years where people actively in a giant media conglomerate conspire to destroy your career so they can protect their money. 
How do we deal with that on a Twitter world where everyone's like, hey, the more likes I get for calling Dave Chappelle a cunt, the better I'm going to look and get booked in this side of the, uh, the entertainment industry. While the other people are like, fuck you, the more I protect Dave Chappelle, the more I'm going to get booked on this side of the sympathetic industry. And I'm stuck in the middle looking at both sides going, you're both terrible at art. And fuck Dave Chappelle. He doesn't care about me. I don't have to care about him. I'm just got to see the system that's fucked him because that's the business I've entered. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to respond to there. I mean, um, that, um, uh, women, gay folks, minorities are always, um, mental illness and that, Oh, she's crazy. He's crazy. Yeah. They're crazy. It's always been leveraged against, uh, against them. It's, it, and sometimes that is it makes them go crazy. Power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, um, and you know, the talent is always seen as replaceable and the platform and the taste makers are seen as irreplaceable, the real shot callers, you know, the, but that, um, that That's Dave Chappelle away. may have been a you know a victim of uh, sort of corporate espionage or you know some sort of Machiavellian uh, bullshit doesn't um, and that he may have been victimized a million times in his life doesn't get him off the hook for what? saying some like some Neighbors, totally dumb nothing shit. I said involves getting mm. anyone off hooks but it's unfortunate that our conversation is so cliched and and comment section styled that the natural conclusion to what I just said was it was an absolution of anything he said. That's fucked up. Like I already have the that's, qualifier. I, that. I, I didn't, I didn't say absolution. I'm, I'm saying, you know, the, um, the idea Dave of Chappelle's the a human being, human beings are complex. The, and that's the riddle of humanity is that we all contain yes. the ability to do good and evil. There are no good people. There are no evil people. You know, the, um, Hitler loved Ava Braun in a way that was absolutely pure. Hitler loved dogs. You know, the um, dogs, not necessarily apparently uh, such a good uh, judge of human character, you know, the, um, but. Well, that's you know, the, actually the greatest analogy you could fucking make. I think we're all fucking dogs and uh, we're these little treats that they give us, make us love Hitler, the entertainment industry. We are. Uh, we are treat driven organisms. It's absolutely. pathetic. It's fucking sad. And as a man, I have a hard time being around a lot of fucking people that I'm around now. Cause I, I can't look at them like men. And I'm talking on a male perspective. Like if I can pull back from the fun of talking that way and talk from more of a humanist perspective too. Um, uh, I have a problem with anybody who's just, um, desperately trying not to be sincere. And because they're lying and they're trying to get away with something and it's unnecessary. It's more often a hassle and it's uh, hurting them. Unfortunately, it's quite often more often hurting them. And it's hard talking to other performers about this, especially ones who are like, you're a different breed. Uh, but when I talk to comedian headliners who are actively trying to manufacture a reality where they're famous a thing that doesn't really exist the way it used to exist, but it's a 20th century idea in a 21st century world. Um, when I explain to them that there's literally hundreds and hundreds of these lost souls that are desperately trying to do the same thing that they're doing, they don't see it as, oh, fuck, maybe I'm on the wrong path and just succeeding at the wrong path. They see it as, oh, you're just around a bunch of open mic shitheads, blah, blah, blah which is who their audience is. Their audience is the only people that really care about stand-up comedy are all the people that think they can do it. It's mostly a casual thing. Yeah. The it's, it's funny because the, I had such a weird sort of entry into the world of stand-up comedy from watching shit on comedy central in the middle 2000s where Dave Chappelle was the only funny thing on and everything else was like the comedians of comedy or whatever, like just blue collar comedy dog shit. The, um, and I thought like comedy sucked. And then is it dog um, shit though? When Ron White's a part of it, like how our approach no, to this, no. <laughs> why do we call it dog shit? Because we're not blue collar. It wasn't made for us. Like this is so infected into our language 
that I think it's polluted the conversations that we have into a left. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm being sincere here. That was my opinion. Then that is my opinion. Now is that at the time there was nothing that I saw on TV that, um, that, that struck me as comedy or funny. Yeah. The, with the exception of Chappelle and then somebody turned me on to Stan hope and then, and, but that was like, uh, the straight edge kid who has a beer on Thursday and then fucking shoots up on Saturday. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, going straight to the to the main line there. I don't but know, you, man. I, you got excited by that. That discovered that act of discovery. Who turned you on to stand up? Uh, a couple of people. The I mean, I I have to give credit to uh, Alex at Music We Trust. He was like, um, you know, this guy Doug Stanhope sometimes has comedians or has musicians open for open up for him. You would really like him, and I was like, the guy from the Man Show. I fucking hate that guy. And then yeah, he was yeah. like, no, you have to watch one of his specials. And then I watched. Um, or I knew I, I'd seen Stanhope in fucking Girls Gone Wild and the. Um, and the man show, which it, yeah, never take the money, never do it for the money because that's the thing that goes out into the world. But, uh, but then I watched one of his specials and it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was like, you know, it was like doing a drug for the first time and just being like, holy shit, this is, this is the stuff. This is the thing. This is the real, it's art, you know? When's the last time you've had that feeling genuinely? Maybe when I was turned on to uh, Coulter Wall couple years ago um and he's a terrifically uh gifted songwriter and uh every, like one of the few people making music now who every time he releases a new thing I, you know there's people i nerd out with about it um yeah. you know one of the few artists who's sort of like whatever making music now that i'm like and i'm envious of him too because he's younger than i am and he sounds oh like, yeah yeah i hate when that happens uh, yeah um but, uh, fucking rich kids but um but I mean, I, that is such a fucking beautiful sensation, right? When you discover a new artist, a new, a new comic, a new writer or something like that, that, you know, it's it sort of, uh, you're dropped onto a moving train or something like that. Right. I, I think the danger, uh, in, in our expression and our ability to create art is in the, uh, feeling, uh, quote unquote, arrived, like you've arrived to a place. Oh, I love that dog. And, uh, when you feel like you've arrived at a place your uh, perspective on the thing that got you there changes because you want to feel strong and important. Uh, I I think self-importance is a virus and and I think it's uh, destroying people's lives. And that's why you see a lot of people who are really good and really talented. Then they move out to LA and they get stuck in that kind of scene. And then they start feeling bad for their success because they feel guilty because so many people are struggling. And then they start striving for self-importance, like, ah, I feel shallow. I, everything I wanted, I got, and it's not good because they weren't really interested in what they were actually making. We're, we, yeah, we're all jockeying for position. And it, it's funny because every – the I'm every, not – well, no, I know you're, you are the one exception there, The but every person I've had on here, the, they, you know, just say, they say, oh, if I could get into the better clubs or if they're in the club, so if I could get into the bigger rooms, the better rooms, if I could get to play stadiums, if I could do arenas, the, yeah, there's yeah, always, always the next thing, you know, for me, for me, I'm like, if I could stop doing living room and basement shows and get back into the clubs that used to book me 10 years ago, like that, yeah. um, but we all have the, you know, the mule and the carrot, you know, we're all trying to get to that next thing. And we're all trying to prevent the people who are f- coming up from under us, trying to get those gigs with us. I'm uh, not, I don't think about, these are all things that I, I refuse to think about because I think it gets in the way of the reality. The, none of those things, the, all that is energy that goes against you making the art. So my question would be, what's your carrot? Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, love, sex, affection, safety, uh, food, the, um, very primitive shit. Yeah. But you can have all that shit without being a basement touring troubadour. There, there is something, I don't know what it is, man. There's something about the, is it, do you, and and you don't have to answer Like, I'm, I'm curious, not the thing is important because it's important to you. To me, it's important. Just the recognition that wait a minute i just said the mule and the carrot to get us moving it's always in front of us dangling in front of me fuck what is the name of that thing that controls me that's being used against me to get me to move this forward without knowing the direction 
Yeah, I mean the so one of the, the you're familiar with the Pavlov's dogs thing about you know the he when, was a very good boy. Yes, the when um you know when he rings the bell when they feeds the dogs they start salivating. One of the things that he found out too was that if he rang the bell and then only fed them once out of every three times, it wouldn't diminish their salivary response. It would increase it. So he basically he taught dogs how to gamble. And I think that's part of what, um, part of why I still tour at the level I tour at is because it, I'm a fucking gambling addict now. Cause I never know if that the show that night is going to be the best show ever where we're all going to walk out of there. Like we're best friends or if it's going to be the fucking worst. And I'm going to be like yeah. trying to fight the manager at the restaurant, you know, <laughs> what the fuck is up Denny's, you know, like fuck, that. man, that's, that's, that's a great angle, man. That's exciting because <laughs> What's an artist uh, like you? You've just defined the difference between an artist and a person who's addicted to gambling. Like that, <laughs> that that instinct that that is real. Like uh, like a fuck it, just go for it is a real impulse. It's part of our nature. Now, when I say what a human being is, is a human being someone who recognizes that as monkey nature shit and learns to manage and discipline and use that energy towards his goals that he chooses. Or is he a monkey reactionary who ends up using that energy based on a carrot that's being dangled and manipulated in front of him? Like that, like who has control over your life is, a, I think, a very interesting, valid question when we try to move forward in life as individuals. Meanwhile, living in a society that we need to learn how to operate as a hive to make or a herd or whatever as a group to get shit done for all. Both things have to exist, but we don't live in a world that can profit off those both things existing unless they're at fucking odds with each other for some reason. Like, hey, like it's, it's so fascinating uh, to me that you are so into these questions, not just that you're so into these questions that they're so important to you, but that, but also that you're able to use them as a means of moving forward, of creating more art, because I do everything and anything I can not to think about any of the questions that you've raised in this conversation so far, because yeah. for me, they, they just, they paralyze me. And they're just the massive of, obstacles. I think to it's creation. the opposite. I and, think it's uh, the opposite. I, I, I love that. Um, that it, it's something that propels you forward. And I don't know that I'll ever understand it. The, it I think I, it's I, so foreign to me. I think I know why. And it's why I enjoy talking to you because I know it's because it is foreign to you. And it's why I think that it's more worthy to talk to you than some who's open to the conversation still, even though the agitations from it uh, and some of the shit you emotionally have to deal with while you're handling it. I have to be uh, respectful of that too. Uh, when I have this conversation, it'd be very easy to get like, I'm a dog on a bone. Like I like chewing it, you know what I mean? But I, at some point I have to learn how to recognize, uh, oh, this might be overwhelming at this point in this person's life because none of this shit is secure. We're gambling with our fucking well beings. So that said, the reason why I enjoy talking to you about this, the reason that it's foreign to you is because, uh, because of the things that drove you to being, uh, a drug addict because of the things that you visually turn you on some of the things that are superficial that you found and use that brain of yours to cr to create depth like your your one ability that i've always admired is your ability to take very superficial things that people just identify and love and then find poetic depths in those things. That to me is a fucking value to the art that you produce, which is why I have no problems telling people and bookers, oh yeah, you should you should take a chance on him. You should, you should, you'll love him. He's every 13 year old's dream of growing up to be. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the reason I say in this aspect is um, what if, uh, it, it, what if, to, fuck off, what if in your art, uh, to do the art that you really want to do what if you get challenged and things aren't working out for you anymore and you're at a and you're lost and you're stuck what if you just asked yourself okay what am i afraid to think about why am i afraid to think about this 
why is the idea of the purpose of what I'm putting out there and trying to get out of this, why does that scare me? Is it because the answer scares me and I might have to deal with something I'm not ready to deal with? Or is it because uh, my uh, imposter syndrome might get validated from something? I mean, none of this fucking shit really matters. At the end of the day, you and I are fucking dipshits <laughs> who are expressing ourselves via very primitive uh, entertainment devices that were established by P.T. Barnum fucking in the 1800s, trying to get away with not having to work for a living because we're probably incapable and you wouldn't want us at your fucking job site. Oh, I absolutely agree. The I'm I'm a, the type of artist I am is a scam artist first and foremost. Yeah. And the me and it's too. Always, We're it, all it, in a it scam. Scams big it's and fun. Small. You know the um and I, yeah, I'm doing everything. I mean, yeah, I do think that fear and pain are my you know my primary motivators. I'm terrified of the thought of ever having to get like a real you know the veil dropping and me having to go. Right. Can you imagine writing a fucking resume now? That's what I tried. That it was so embarrassing. They, oh I couldn't God, get hired they, at Dave and Buster's. Uh, yeah, I, the, I, I, if I have, ever have to go back to work, I'll be a fucking doorman for the rest of my life. The, right, you know, but and, what does that mean to you? Does that mean that your life was wasted and ruined? No, but you're going to feel that way. So you're. Gonna yeah, I mean, to- I think I'm terrified of feeling that way, feeling insignificant. I mean, I think one of the things that um, was communicated to me early on as a child, and never do this to your fucking kids, was that I was told that I was special. And that's like the most destructive and damaging thing you can do to a child is communicate to tell them that they're special. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me tell you this one. Uh, when I was <laughs> when I was nine. I wasn't just told that I was special. Uh, I was also told by the people that were telling me I was special and trying to uh, teach me Russian and Japanese. And uh, I was trying to write screen. It was insane. Uh, My mom was like a a genius, but insane. Uh, They said I was going to have schizophrenia at like at nine years old. They go, yeah, yeah. Probably about 17 to 24. You're going to develop a mental schizophrenia. You're going to go crazy like your mother. I would have loved to have just been told I was special. (laughs) <laughs> not this oh yeah sometime in the future your your reality is going to slip away and everything you know is going to be a, a, a societal lie and people are not going to trust you and you're going to fall you're going to lose you, you would have settled for just the you know this movie has a cool twist ending without them actually spelling out everything no i i, I never believed in special i never believed in myself i wasn't raised that way because i was surrounded by cokeheads doing literally lines off CCR and Jimi Hendrix albums while telling me I could grow up to be president at five years old. I knew that was bullshit. My mom told me my mom went to go and see that I can beat up on my mom right now. Cause she made it out of surgery. Okay. The, she, she went to go see a, uh, a psychic or a medium or something. And this, uh, this person told her that her son was going to be, was going to go through some darkness. And then when he was 27 or 28, he was going to be very, very rich. And when I turned 29, I lamented and I was like, it's over my, it, this is just like the La Bamba soundtrack. I, the my life is over. The Richie, Santo, and Johnny are playing that slide. <laughs> yeah, the and then uh, yeah, and then I grieved for you know another I don't know four years. Yeah, and then you have to fucking listen to other Canadians like Jim Carrey who wrote himself a check and then got to pull it out of his wallet on live TV. Look, I made my million dollars. I honored this check because I myself. And you're like, it doesn't work every time, you motherfucker. <laughs> it's a carnival trick at best. You got to have the ingredients. How many people are inspired by fucking athletes and were like, just do it, man. Michael Jordan, be a sociopath. Just care all in. You're like, you don't have what Michael Jordan has. Yeah. You just don't have it. It's not the same thing. But we believe in ourselves because our lives don't really matter. What we do for work, how we, our communities have been fucking completely ripped from us. And it's only motivated by shallowness and greed. Uh, to an extent, like this can't be everyone's world for sure. This is just an anecdotal perspective. Uh, absolutely. I'm allowed to make it as my experiences, but at the same time, I'll, I do want to pause and take a moment and realize that not everybody's going through this, but it still fucking exists. Do you think that there is still a way for there to be meaningful human connection with or without a platform? Absolutely. I, I, I think that's I think that's the reason why we've succeeded this far as a species. 
uh, is our ability, uh, you know, you remember like at your worst moments, you know, like uh, how people come together, you know, when the real shit really matters, you know, earthquake, hurricane, tornado, people are shitty, but there, there's a brief moment where every drops it. Not 9-11 you know, transformed New York. It was not the same city after that happened. It it was yeah. like the literally city. Everybody was, yeah, everybody, but everybody was fucking holding doors for each other. You okay? Do you need a hand there? And it, the, um, and it was, it was only when we figured out that it was okay to hate cops again, that I felt like the city had recovered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I remember, I, I, I remember 2012 when that Ferguson started happening. I was like, man, there's some shit in the news they're trying to cover up because they're bringing this back. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. They lost it. It's out of their hands. Ah, welcome to the new media. Like think of uh, our strategies, man. You've got to ask what the audience is looking for. And I'm only saying that what all this stuff isn't philosophical. It really is business. I look at a lot of sports media to, to see what's going to be coming ahead of us. Uh, for instance, you're starting a podcast. You've made a lot of connections over the years with a lot of people in different aspects of, of an industry. People are hungry to find out and learn from so that they can succeed. Whether they vocalize it or not, they're fucking hungry for it. And you know you have something that can be beneficial, that can work as product to push the art you actually want to do. So, um, sorry, I got lost in three arguments there because, like, that's what people have to do now. It, I think in, podcasting in makes them lesser at what you do, but it also fills up your time. So it depends on time management. I don't want to get into that. What I want to point out for all the people being told that they have to start a podcast and you're not successful unless you do a podcast. Well, think of the people. Why do I think this way? Seems like a lot of people that own the platforms that you have to pay to be on for your podcast and invest in for your podcast and buy equipment in from podcast packaging who don't have Sennheiser sponsorships. It seems like a lot of people are making money. There's an entire industry off making sure everyone starts podcasting, even though no one's listening to it. Never mind the fact that all the celebrities and the devaluing of celebrity is starting to happen to where they're all getting podcasts. So your guests, not your specific, but everyone's ideal guests is going to have their own podcast to all their celebrity friends, they're on a higher level. So all these people trying to get in the podcasts are, it's a fruitless endeavor for them unless they win the lottery somehow, or they get some sort of uh, attention uh, and use the, the anger of a left-right paradigm. But in the very future, you're not going to be able to get a great athlete or a great artist or a great anybody to do your podcast because that's their money. Those stories become their content, become their money. And once that perspective starts breeding down to the regular public, all our music friends and comedy friends are going to be like, fuck, I bought into it. I wasted my time and I'm going to be fucking standing there. Hey, remember that thing that I'm always right two years before it fucking happens and y'all call me fucking crazy, but I'm like, watch out because you need to be aware of this. This isn't meta. This isn't philosophy. It's just foresight and business sense. You know how creativity works because you know if they're writing songs like this over here, well, we're going to focus on songs over here. Hey, new styles. We, we abused blues. We abused jazz. Fuck it. There's this thing, island music called reggae. It's the 70s. People are hungry for new. Let's just give them this new and they'll pretend that Calypso music is interesting in the 80s when clearly it sucks. Clearly it sucks in the hands of fucking Steve Winwood. I'm sorry. There's so many arguments here, but you know what I'm saying? Or in you hindsight, don't, I am a hinge, I, you know. I, I'm not sure why. I wasn't sure why I was starting a podcast, but in hindsight, I think I was starting a podcast so I could get off ketamine and it worked. And it's so no, fucking I love weird. That. And part of it was just that, just exactly what's happening tonight of just talking to an old friend at length about a million different subjects and just following the conversation wherever it goes. And just the, just having that reconnection and the um, challenging excited, and getting challenged and the, and yeah, just the, uh, you know, uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's the fucking best drug out there, you know? Um, just to connect with another, another intellect, another creative, somebody, you know, another artist, the, um, I don't know. It, it, it's the best shit. Isn't, that, isn't it I, fun to just say that openly? Oh, I'm doing it. 
because I really just enjoy this and I, I needed something to help me compensate for uh, an addictive personality. I like I had to start working it out, so I cut off all the sleeves of my shirt. I understand it feel it's nuts. I'm not a fan of it, but it worked. You know, like shame, like I had to use, I knew shaming, I knew this was embarrassing to me and I knew it would force me to do something. So you have to learn yourself that way and learn it's, how to it's manage. It's all about self-knowledge. Right. But the shaming, and this might be a Canadian thing too. I always forget that about you is that you're inherently, you got Canadian baggage and sorries to, to throw out there. <laughs> but truthfully, the feeling of how you're, that approach to a podcast, here's what I'm doing. If eight people listen, I enjoy that because the enjoyment and the purpose of this is this. It's to do this. Anything after that is just extra. The joy is right here. That's how we manage our depression and our emotions and our expectations, as opposed to uh, a problem I'm having with a, a close brother of mine, like a friend, a, a person I love dearly, but he's like constantly getting into these bad business situations of people clearly using him, like just openly. Like he wanted to record an album. He just wanted to record an album for 20 albums to give it to friends and family. He's not touring really. He's not doing much. He's a family guy. That was his expectations. Well, now it's a special and they're trying to sell it to people and he's getting sold into it. Like, oh, I'm going to have a special. I'm like, what are you going to He goes, What are you going to do with it? He's like, I don't know. He's like, do you really want to give them an hour of the past 20 years of your life that you worked hard on? and give these people 50% ownership of it and never be able to use it ever again. And turns out it doesn't give you the work and now you can't use it because they fucking own it. That's the only money you get. So in, in dealing with this problem and talking about podcasts and what's in the future, I started pitching people a project and uh, I started pitching multiple people a project. And I said, no matter what, we're going to do a live show because it has to be live. We're going to film it and pretend it's a TV show. And all those cameras are just going to, all those clips are just for social media. There's no real TV show. Let's pretend we're making fun of this, but the audience will sink in and you'll sink in because the cameras make you feel like this is the most important thing because you're a fucking sucker and you come from 20th century values. Create a good show. But the show is not what's important. These conversations right here are what's important. The behind the scenes. What are you actually working on? So like if Mishka, if you were doing a part on the show, I would be like, yeah, the show's great. It's just clips. It's doing fantastic. It's getting us the numbers audience. But what musically are you doing that you actually give a shit about? This is the horse shit we got to do. So we're, we're roasting karaoke singers. It's fucking bullshit. It's nothing. It's Jesus. We have Jesus Christ getting roasted, singing Doobie Brothers. Fuck it. We don't give a fuck. <laughs> it's hilarious. We don't care. Here's the things I really care about. And through the process of discovery, the audience gets that feeling of, oh, man, I would never stumble to this if I didn't see the stupid stuff. And out of context, now it's contrast. I'm getting all these different points of views. I'm listening to them talk about it. And they're, they're telling me about the project that they want to do. And I'm, I want to do stuff, too. And at the end of our project, we say, hey, you can do it, too, because none of us own entertaining the rest of us. This isn't a status symbol. This isn't a caste system. There is no place. Your place is always going to be your place. Whatever you get is what you get, but no one deserves anything. And I think these are values that we lose. And anything that gets in conflict with that is because it's in conflict with the money. So now I'm, I'm doing podcasts all day today, and I, I got to get off in a better 50 or message a guy in a bit here. Yeah, I got I got to bounce too. I was this is actually a perfect segue for uh, for you to give me your plugs. Uh, I'm Jay, not what are you be, selling? I'm actually <laughs> uh, I'm going to be I've taken most of my stuff offline, and uh, I got two specials left on YouTube. And only because I'm doing your podcast, I'm going to leave them up for the next fifteen days. Awesome! I, I'm taking everything down, and um, because that's that's your money. You know, it shouldn't be out there for free and no one gives a shit. So you should be more precious about that stuff so that when people do get it, they do get that experience. Of it. it needs to be less is more. We need to go back to that. We can't compete if everyone's just flooding the market and we're operating in this 2008 notion that we'll just be discovered by the populace and it'll blow up. Things go viral all the time that do not translate into sales. This is all shit yeah. we should not even be bothered with. 
pursuing what we care about and, and, and following through. So unfortunately, my project right now is finding ways to help out my friends who are all falling apart in their own ways, struggling, drowning in this platform pool. I see a lot of talent. So my idea is coming up of all these projects that I can use on my end to advertise their talents and do it in a way that doesn't have the fucking, we're all producers is basically what it's come down to. The art is not an artist driven medium. It's a content driven medium. So we're producers, but we still have to produce good shit, which means we got to think about more of the real shit instead of the illusory shit or the, um, the, the, the aesthetic shit. So one project that I have that I'll pitch to you that I don't know will do, but I, I like it. I'm, I'm talking to Mike Weeby. Uh, uh, I'm writing an, a classic rock album. I love uh, this idea. I, I, I want to write a classic rock album. I want it to be a legendary classic rock album. So that's the goal. I don't, I'm not precious about it. I just think it's funny to tell people, oh, I'm going to write a legendary classic rock album. But I don't want to do things alone. I don't believe in that. I think there's more. The Beatles were better together, not separate. So I would, you know, what are my what are the things I'm insecure about? And I don't like talking about this, but I'm really insecure about my voice and the fact that I haven't played in a while. And I, I'm really scared to put my lyrics down because I never really focus on them. It's more free thought. And, you know, really, I'm just hiding that. You know, it's easier to do comedy, but that's like fucking the hardest thing. So since it's the hardest thing, I'm recording those processes, all the squeaks, all the bad takes, the entire process of putting it together so that people can understand we got to stop making that part precious or hidden. That's the story now. That's what people are interested in. So I got a demo I, I wrote in, in, in eight, nine days. My roommate went to out of town, so I, I recorded in his closet. A, the legendary classic rock album, or at least the skeletons, the the bones for one. And I got to write lyrics. Uh, I'm still doing that. So I'm going to go interview my good buddy and lyricist Mishka to, uh, to, to, to look at the lyrics I'm writing. And then maybe what would you write in this section? And I would film the, the dialogue between your decisions and your melody choices based on Okay, you're you're not singing this. So what would you do if you weren't singing? You've had to think as a singer this whole time. How does Mishka think when he's challenged with this creatively? There's no other direction than this is the show. So the process can fail. That's not a big deal. We can write a shitty song. I'm going to protect us from that because where this project's evolved to, I went to Mike Weeby because I want him to sing instead of me. Uh, or at least I can do harmony or some shit because he's so fucking incredible, but he has a different voice than a lot of, he, he talks things. He's one of the greatest front men of all time. Thank you. That's what I've been trying to tell people. We His is album, fucking incredible. Yeah. You know what? Part of my project with him is I'm forcing people to listen to the Dracula's album that came out in 2020 during everything. That's uh -huh. the best rock album I've heard in a long time. It's my favorite. It's one of my favorite albums and I can't listen to it. <laughs> I don't listen to it. I don't listen to it. And I told this to Mike's face. And I go, Mike, I want to explore this because I think this is really interesting. That something that I know was the best that year. And I loved it. And it's fucking good. Dynamically, all the thoughts there. I go, but why can't I enjoy this? Am I too old to enjoy stuff anymore? Is my association with media completely polluted because I've done so much on this side of it and seen so much? Like, are these fundamental human questions that's why i only ask all the stuff that you think is philosophical that will break you it's not you're just being a fucking bitch <laughs> and because that's part of your brand and identity you know how to function your strength comes from weakness i find value to that i also think that true strength comes from constantly testing that weakness and, and understanding where your true strengths actually lie so I know that if I brought to you a synth song that was an impression of Italio Disco, where we decided to do a soundtrack to an album that doesn't exist set in the 80s, I'm freeing you of the baggage of a troubadour or Mishka and all the identity that you've created to market and sell the authentic version of you you want to put out there to entertain. Well, now I'm just getting your actual thinking and your thoughts and your real creativity and showing people there's more to you and a value and the thinking behind all the things that they already enjoy. 
so that you can still use that as your content, even though it's its own show. And at the end of the day, we're putting out an album. That to me is the whole fucking point of doing this now. That's what entertainment is today, 21st century. We have to think in those terms. And unfortunately, when you're doing it by yourself, you fail at all of it. The, uh, yeah, give, what, give a man a mask and he'll speak the truth, right? The, um, I, I, I don't, right? I, I was, unfortunately, I was born in a schizophrenic family of lunatic gypsies. So I decided that I was just going to start embracing just, just not radical honesty, just, well, you know, open to being wrong, but this is what I see. This is what I feel from people and, and perspectives. And then they go, yeah, that's exactly what this is. And I'm like, you think it might be because the things that are controlling you, you kind of gave up your own power to, and all you have to do is just kind of take a breath and realize you have every right to fail at art. Fair enough. It doesn't make you less. The goal is that your best work is always supposed to be ahead of you. So the whole project that I want to do is talking to my friends and people that I love and care about and saying, hey, I think this depression shit is being used against us when it can be used for us. And it's not something to run away from or it's not something to market. It's not something to telegraph to people because we don't know how to communicate as individuals anymore. We can just throw that away. Let's do a really stupid art project together and just have fun being creative and realize that was the energy and spirit of everything that we come from today. And if we can show that on film and create something cool and stupid from our experiences, how fun would it be to do other stuff or, and ask people that what they would do and who they would work with and, and call and then have them submit it so that we can showcase regular people expressing themselves the way that they genuinely wish that they could do because they want to so bad and they can't. So they look up to dipshits like us and we don't have the heart to tell them. And I try to, I, I do it. I know you can't. I tell them, I'm a fucking nobody. <laughs> like, there's 18 of you that agree with you and I appreciate it, but I don't think about these things. It would ruin any of the, the real progress I think I could make with this shit. If I just take a couple of years off to challenge myself with some real self-analysis and in-depth perspectives, not from philosophy as much as just practical business sense, what the fuck do you want? You don't even know, do you? So don't tell me what the fucking say. It's all it comes down to. Dave Chappelle can do whatever the fuck he wants. We know what he's want through. And I'm allowed to say, I agree with that, but I think that's fucking stupid. And I think that's shallow. And I think you've been worked yourself, Dave. Because now you're agreeing with Elon Musk, who's just a never dipshit, but this guy has billions of dollars, so I guess he's good. This is a culture of greed that creates values that aren't mine. I don't know how to entertain those people so they can go fuck themselves, and I hope it works out for them. And I, I guess I'm just going to entertain Mishka. Jay, I love you. Thank you so much for coming through in the clutch with this. And uh, I'll, see you in, uh, I'll see you in San Antonio in, in uh, I don't know, three or four weeks. There's no way in fucking hell I'm doing that shit. No, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll be there. I'm not there. No it's going to be fine. It'll be fine. And uh, you don't have to ask me to podcast just because I book something that I haven't booked in two years. By the way. <laughs> now, you're not even current on your booking. But I'll do it. I'll fucking. I love it. I love you. Man. Jay, I love you so much. Thanks so much for doing this, brother. Hey, get the fuck out of here. All right. Take care. Later, brother. Folks, thank you so much for listening. I know there's uh, there's a million podcasts out there. We appreciate you uh, you spending your time with us. The um, if you're digging the show, if you're enjoying it, if you if these conversations uh, move you, make you laugh, annoy you, piss you off, um, please take a minute to uh, to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, it helps us grow the show and it helps other people find it. Um, if you'd like to hear bonus episodes, song demos, just sort of uh, ranting off the cuff uh, conversations, all sorts of different uh, bonus material, writing advice, uh, personal blog posts and stuff like that, uh, go to patreon.com slash Mishka Shibali. Uh, we will be having monthly episodes up there with my mom and I answering uh questions from readers 
and there's all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, thank you so much for supporting.